Steve, oh, it's, no. so good. <laughs> it's so good to see you again. I see that you have a friend there with you. His name's Jake. You want to introduce him? Well, he's not only my friend, but uh, he was my student for five years, still, still is my student, but more importantly, Jake is an employee of Saks Gourmet Products. Uh, and this is true. That, this is very true. And he, we're very proud of him uh, because uh, since he got his degree last year uh, at Loyola University uh, in saxophone, Jake is working all the time. Why? Because Jake can play. How did Jake learn to play? Well, I showed him a few things that he practiced. So remember, good work ethic, make it possible for anything you want, anything you want. Awesome. All right, what would you like to know there, Miss Donna? All right, cool. Well, before we even get totally started, so Jake, your last name is Pepper, you said? Yeah. Okay, what we're going to do in the show notes, too, is um, in addition to Steve's information and Steve's links, we're going to put, Jake, we're going to put your information as well. Okay, so just remind me at the end, we'll catch that for sure. But yeah, it's, people uh, people may not know who you are, Steve, so can you just give them a little brief summary of what who you are, what you've done, and your your products and all that kind of thing? Well, I don't, I don't mind uh, telling you all of that, Donna, because really, on all the stuff I've done, the statute of limitations has run out on virtually everything. So, uh, you know, we feel safe. So truly and truly, we have been in business with this company or its ancestors since 1972, uh, which means I was in the saxophone business of, you know, manufacturing or modifying or whatever uh, since right after the earth cooled. Now, very honestly, um, we have, uh, beginning in the early 90s, like 1993 or so, we began manufacturing products in a big way. Um, and we manufacture, currently, the world's most expensive saxophone, completely handmade. And all. Oh, and by the way, everybody asks, how much is it, Steve? $18,500. You'll wait nine months to get it, and you'll thank me when you get it. Um, we also make a very full line of mouthpieces, all of which are uh, my original design and are very different from the stuff uh, other people have, you know, out there. And uh, we also, in addition to a bunch of miscellaneous accessories, key clamps and pad powder, never stick, you know, prepare treatments and all that. We also manufacture more necks, the subject of today's uh, podcast, uh, than anybody else in the industry. And I want to tell you something, Donna, we have been making necks since 1994. I sell more than anybody else in the industry. And I have done it long, but we've got hundreds, if not thousands of necks wow. all over the world uh, to fit just about any kind of reasonable saxophone. So we, we know what we're talking about. And we've also conducted a lot of experiments about that. I'm a graduate of uh, Auburn University. Uh, I put myself through school playing at them honky tonks and bars. I have been to every continent except Antarctica playing uh, with some of the biggest rock and roll bands in the world. Um, I learned to play the saxophone primarily uh, through public schools. Uh, and I point out that when I was 14 years old, I was first chair in the Alabama All-State Band. And uh, I, I lived in essentially Birmingham, Alabama. I was first chair when I was in the seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th grade in the all county band. They have a big one. They got like 35 high schools in Birmingham, something like that in Chattanooga. But I believed in practice. So uh, my wife and I own this corporation. 65% of my business is outside the United States. Um, and, you know, they're places where it surprises us in a way while we're very. You know, they love me in Norway for some reason. 
Now I got some very good friends in Norway, uh, but why, why did Norway decide to love me? We're grateful for it. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. And they also seem to be quite fond of me in Australia. Uh, I, I don't know why, but we sell all over the world. We have our products manufactured to our specification. We don't buy anything off the shelf. Nothing. Everything that we sell is to our unique design. And where can you get it? You can buy it from me or you can buy it from me. Other than that, you can buy it from me. Because we, we, we used to have 21 dealers in the United States and a distributor in Europe, and I don't know how many dealers they have, and a distributor in Asia. I don't remember how many they had, but one morning I got up feeling grumpy and fired all the dealers because some of them dealers owed me huge money. And I decided to send some. I, I've got it covered up now, but it, it, the people used to think there's a tattoo up here that said bank and that <laughs> they could owe me money. So right now, we very happily uh, manufacture our own products. We're all the time coming up with new stuff. And I am always available to answer questions to anybody that has a question about saxophone design, about acoustic theory for saxophones, uh, you know, about our products, of course, um, and uh, the meaning of life. Just... Uh, <laughs> The effects of planetary alignment on <laughs> intonation, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. We knew. Where would people be able to contact you for that before we get started? The easiest way to contact me is we have two primary websites, uh, which are our information site, which has more historical information patent drawings, uh, historic than anywhere else in the world, and that's saxgourmet.com. We've had that website since 1995. Wow. And uh, there, there's also where we publish our famous value guide, so you can look up, you can really find out how old is Grandpa Paul's saxophone and what is it worth. Uh, but that I think Sax Gourmet gets more traffic than any other saxophone-related site on the internet. Uh, now, we have a retail site that sells, that strictly sells our products that we design and manufacture, and that's nationofmusic.com. And everything on Nation of Music, I design. And if you'll come visit me in New Orleans, uh, I'll show you a box full of prototypes that didn't make the cut, you know, hey, here's some nets that are kind of crazy. We tried this, didn't work, or something else worked better, uh, because we're forever experimenting. We think that's important. Um, but you can find me at either of those websites. Also, my office phone number is uh, on nationofmusic.com, the upper right-hand uh, corner of the uh, main menu, and you feel free to call me with your questions um, during business hours. Um, and, uh, but we get a lot of calls every day, um, you know, and try to answer them to the best of our ability. And so also, and, and also on that site too, I'm assuming for international people, there's probably um, like a contact form where they can contact you or an email or something like that. Yeah, there's email. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great. We get, you wouldn't believe how many emails I get a day. You know, and most of them are, how old is Grandpa's saxophone and what's it worth? Or, Steve, I want to use uh, a neck off my Selmer Super 80 on a Con 10 m Can I do that? Okay, got it, got it, got it. Those Well, well actually... I don't, I don't know. Can you use Ford parts on Chevrolet? Because therein <laughs> lies the answer. There you I go. Mean, yeah, so so let's get into um, that's actually a perfect lead into in terms of next. What got you so interested in you know in in producing your own next designing next? What got you so interested in the seventies? Um, I was playing with some extremely 
famous and big time rock and roll bands. Big time. Um, you know, stadium shows, all that sort of stuff. And uh, a certain company uh, whose office, they have an office in Paris, but the factory is not in Paris, it's in Montes, France. Um, I got to know some of them, or some of the family that owns that, or owned it at the time, family has since sold it. But uh, they gave me a solid silver net to use on my Mark VI. Now, at the time, they didn't sell solid silver necks, but they gave them to uh, Indian chiefs and course repeaters and, you know, and rock stars. That would be me. Um, and I was amazed at how much difference a neck made. Um, I would go to a recording set, and, and so I started accumulating necks. And so uh, I would go to a recording session, and I'd have a box I took with me that would have half a dozen mouthpieces in it, all different, and then a half dozen necks. And like, okay, Miss Producer, how do you want it to sound? Because you can have this and this, or you can have that and that. Uh, because you, there's not one saxophonist out there out of a thousand who knows anything about necks. And so many of them are what I call sheeple. That, that they just, they listen to what somebody is telling them about necks and believe it and shouldn't. But they do because they don't know any difference and they have no context to tell them to do it. So in, I think this is correct, 1998, we produced our first neck that was my design, and it was unique. And by then, I had read everything, I think, uh, that you could find anywhere on the planet about neck design. And at that time, there wasn't very much. Um, I read all the uh, books about woodwind acoustics and that. And I learned some stuff that um, I thought, well, I could incorporate into necks and improve their performance. Then I went to work in, a, I'm going to say early 2000s. Uh, I was taking lessons from Sandy Runyon, who owned the famous Runyon Mouthpiece Company. But a lot of people don't know this about Sandy. But of his time on this earth, and he died at age 95. And oh, wait, what a great guy. I got a lot of good Sandy stories we'll save for another episode. But Sandy introduced me to the guys in Asia that were manufacturing saxophones and other accessories. Because if you think about it, Around then, there weren't a lot of Asian saxophones being imported in the United States. So somebody had to teach them how to manufacture saxophones and about acoustics. That would be moi, because I had the blessing of Sandy Runyon. Well, once I established some relationships over in Asia, and those are wonderful people over there, um, I could then say, would you send me uh, 50 neck tube blanks that I can use to experiment on? Ah, nobody else could do that, but I could. And so, you know, one day uh, FedEx would show up, they'd have a big box, they nothing in it but neck tubes. So we could experiment with uh, tapers, you know, diameters, links and all that sort of thing and we we're big on the hands-on approach and I've read all the academic papers and the doctoral dissertations and what few textbooks there are about this and most of that stuff doesn't tell you anything that will really make it so but 
if you'll understand the acoustic theory, then I can take the neck off a Con 10M, for example, and compare it to the neck of a Super 20 or a Selma Mark 6, and I can tell you the difference. And if I know the difference, then I might know something I could do to that original Mark 6 neck that would uh, make it play better. And if I know that, then I might could make you a neck from scratch that played even better. Now, we had some other people, uh, primarily in Asia, uh, but that taught us a lot about manufacturing techniques. In other words, something you, Donna, and I know you're a master player and all that, but Donna, do you know how, if we had a saxophone factory there, uh, how we would bend the neck without it wrinkling at the point of the bend? Of course not. <laughs> of course you didn't. Um, well, we learned how to do all that stuff and bought the requisite equipment so we could um, make prototypes. Because unless you've tried it, you know, you don't know. And then we also kept uh, copious notes about what we did on our necks. You know, that this worked better on the con, this worked better on the buffet, this worked better on Calworth, do this, don't do that, you know, all that. Uh, are those available? No. I, I am not going to do research for other companies. That being said, as you know, Donna, but most people don't know this about me, something that's a big business for me, big business for my company, I do design consulting for Asian companies. And frankly, I'm designing horns for my competitors. They just don't know it's me. Ah. The factories don't tell them. But the factories will make one and it'll be out of tune or whatever. And they'll send the one that doesn't play right to me. Say, Steve, how do you fix this? What do you do about that? And, you know, I know the guys that own the factories over there. They know me, know who I am. But the average saxophone player doesn't need to know all that. But, uh, you, you know, we, we take care of that on our end. So we have made thousands of necks over the years. We've been doing this a long time. We know what works on Selmer versus a Yamaha versus a Yonaga Salma versus a Calwer versus Khan versus Bisher, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And consequently, I'm able to, you know, if you came to me and said, now look, Steve, I've got this Mark VI, and I'm currently using a Series three neck on it, which I know you are. Oh, my uh, alto, yeah, yeah. yeah it, no, I know that about you. Huh? Uh, you know, I said, I like the way that's working for me. Well, you should. There's a reason that's working. But, you know, Donna, you should try this. If you like that, you'll really like this. And we think we are a unique repository of that information. Because um, I swear, uh, when I'm at, you know, say the NAM show or such as that, and it's four in the morning and we're sitting at the bar, there are people, I can count on one hand the number of people I'll sit there and talk to about neck acoustics because I don't know anybody else that knows anything about it. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about this too? Uh, just two things actually. The funny thing is for my alto, so it's a Mark VI, and the neck, uh, I had the original neck, I think that came with that, and it just was so stuffy. It, it just was awful. Yes. And so my uh, repair person at the time, um in new york in suffolk county um he was like you know um i've got another neck i think that will work better for you I'm like okay i try i was like great that's so that that's the level of my knowledge like okay this is awesome and then someone said to me in a video hey you know your neck is it that doesn't look like a mark six neck i'm like huh i totally forgot i totally forgot that you know i bought that other neck and um yeah it's a series three neck and it yeah it makes that that mark six you know yeah. 
sing. But, you know, the funny thing is you, you're saying like, you know, you could count on one hand, if even that, how many people you could talk to at the bar at NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants show uh, in Anaheim, um, you know, about necks and stuff like that. And I totally agree with you because for me, yeah, I'm, I'm a little ignorant. I think most players are. We just want the horns to work. We want the mouthpieces to work. But um, that that's going to lead to this question. I, I'm about not talking about players like you, because you're a master player, Donna, but I'm talking about manufacturers. Mm. That, that, you know, you say, uh, hi, oh, wait a minute, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Give, yeah, here it is. Jay and for Bob. those of you that are listening right now, I'm going to encourage you to watch the video for this because you got to see Steve's background with all this amazing stuff in the background and this neck. Oh, my God. What is that? <laughs> that is awesome. All right, you see those marks on there? Yeah, yeah. That okay. actually is a great design. I got to say, that's a great no, design. No, no, no. <laughs> I know, I know that. I know it's not. I know it's marks for, for something else, but that's a great design. <laughs> this, 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 this is a working, this is a working neck. All right, now let me tell you what we got here. One thing, I know you're a smarter woman than this, but we're not concerned so much uh, with the way the air travels through the neck. We're concerned with how the energy wave created by the reed and the mouthpiece travels through there. And anything we can do to facilitate that uh, energy wave is going to help us make better music on our saxophone. Air, not so important. But I don't want the air to resist the energy wave. Oh, so... Um, if you remember your course in college about uh, acoustic theory, where you probably use the Benet book, most of which is incorrect, by the way, um, but um, if you use the Benet book, or all that, then you know that as that wave goes through, we can predict accurately um, the, the, the pressure nodes, where the wave goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. And we can plot that as to where it hits the, the sides of the neck on the interior. And subsequently, if we know that, we can mark it on here. He's and marked it on the neck. For, let's say for the purposes of discussion that this neck, we marked it and recorded our responses. And we found that Right here, where this big mark is, see that? Yes. I, I did that because I knew what I found out with this neck. That was for the fourth line D. Okay, which even on your fine instruments, and I know what you got. You got good horns. Y'all be y'all be playing saxophone, my darling. But that's all right. Now you still you still my buddy. Uh, but but the <laughs> the fact of the matter is. I know that that is fourth line D. And if that D is a little stuffy or a little flat or a little shot, whatever, if I'll concentrate my work on the diameter here, I can fix it. Mm. And we're talking to tenor neck folks, by the way, if you're not, if you're just listening. Uh, same, everything I say applies to altos. Oh, well. okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Because I know like tenor, the, the fourth line D can sound stuffy. And, and for like some of the older horns, the D will sound really sharp. And for alto, that D, people tend to overshoot it. Now, a lot of times it's an embouchure issue. They're biting, but sometimes it can well, be. Well, we're no better than biting. That's right. <laughs> we're the teachers. They the teachers. <laughs> no, but it's, but it's, no, no, you're right. You're right. And, and, and also, Donna, you know this. Every brand and model of saxophone go have different characteristics. You know, yeah. so don't expect your cylinder to have the same pitch characteristics as a Yamaha or whatever. It's going, are they all going to be different? Now, uh, another thing that's going on hmm, is on this one. Can you see that little thing on the end beyond the core? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Ha! Ah, now, Donna. Uh, you've flown in airplanes many times in your life and you know 
that the way an airplane works, lift is generated by the air flowing over the top of the wing, flowing at a faster rate than the air going on the bottom of the wing. You remember somebody once telling you that? Look it up. That's true. Okay? That's how it works. Oh, that's a, a gross simplification, but that's how it works. Now, which also leads me to the fact that moving air like that has less resistance. You buy into that? Okay. Very good. Then, Donna, if I can reduce the resistance inside this neck, you want to be more free blowing. Now, won't it? And it'll have, just trust me on this, it'll have a larger dynamic range. Right now, Donna, your horn's probably got a dynamic range of about that big. Okay. But look here, I modify the neck, but it'll have a dynamic range of that big, where mm. you have softer PNS nose and louder for PC I don't want to do that. Cool. I can also increase the volume input on the neck by, and, and now this gets into some voodoo, and you better know what you're doing, because once it's done, it's done very I can change the taper, particularly right in here. Okay, where the cork is. Yeah, okay. I'm under the cork. Right, right. I, I, I can change the taper of the metal, and I can make your horn less resistant if I want to. Oh. Now I'm curious uh, with that neck that you're holding right now. So the uh -huh. cork, the cork is not to the very end. It's not. Why should it be? Okay, that's interesting. Why should it be? That's right, because we have what we call a neck. Do we have a neck now, it's huge? It's right on the end. Well, I know we got one on this, but we got to loop. Take out one. Oh yeah, yeah. Take out one. Oh sure, we sell this product. So you see, we got one on this too, and you can take them out, put them in. It's, it's an extension, basically. Oh. In, in a way, yes. But it's got a specific taper, so it compresses the airstream and, and uh, accelerates the velocity of the airstream. Oh, that is interesting. Um, all right, so that's a neck, you call it a neck uh, extension? That's my number one selling product. Okay, and that has to, that obviously has to fit, you know, the, 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 uh, the brand of saxophone that you have, I, I would assume, or no. That's a no-brainer. If you've got a notebook with all those specs in it. I yes, know. right, 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 right. Got it, got it. Okay. Furthermore, it has to be compatible with the mouthpiece that you are using. Right, right, right. But yeah. uh, we, we also have notes on that. Um, yeah. I, and really, this, this will change your life. That little piece right there, that'll change your life. Because it will, uh, for example, on your tenor, Typically, well, on tenors, berries, all of them, you press the octave key and it sounds like the horn when you go from C on the third space to D on the fourth line, then it picked up a, a different voice. Different timbre, yeah. I'm fixed. I... With that neck extender? Yeah. Okay, and cool. Also, another thing, I know you drill your students. Uh, your private students have to play scales to your satisfaction. Well, if we're playing a G scale, I want to make sure that all the notes in that scale are tempered evenly to one another, equal in timbre, and, um, you know, uh, uh, intense, you know, just all the different. The thing uh, I can do it with that. That's so interesting, and and so what's really important here, I think, um, for people to understand too. You know, there's so many people that have spoken to on the podcast, and I just know this myself as well. When you're buying an instrument, when you're buying a mouthpiece or whatever, you want the instrument 
you don't want the instrument to get in the way. In other words, you're buying something that oh. is going to help you to express yourself and, you know, you don't want to fight the instrument. Now, yes, there's always problems with reeds. I understand that. But the thing is that we're talking about equipment right here and that, that neck extender is really interesting, especially, you know, with what you're saying too, if, um, people don't some people may not realize that are listening to this that when you're playing a scale you think oh i just press down the buttons and you know everything's gonna be nice and in tune that's not that's not what it is i mean there's certain areas of the horn where um for each different model it's gonna be you have to know the pitch tendencies of the horn we said that already steve said you that already also have to be able to mentally visualize that yeah, hear it. Pitch yeah before you try to play a pitch visualization oh yeah concept as a brass I know, player, I know, I know what this. A yeah. Sounds like, and yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, for sure. Let, let me take our our neck here a little bit and show you some other things while I've got this out. Okay. What in the world are, are those? Oh yeah. So those. Okay. So these are attached. Um, actually tell us, you know, so people can understand this if those they're listening. Are, those um, are, are nodal weights. I knew where the node I wanted to uh, influence, where the pressure nodes for that was. See, I got it marked even on this one. Gotcha. But if I increase the mass of the horn at that point, suddenly it's a different world. And oh. Uh, now, that's not all the tricks we got, but mm, nobody else doing this. Because, frankly, nobody else understands where those lines go. Right, and the li he's referring to the lines that are drawn on the tenor neck and that he's showing us right now. We've um, done something on alto, alto necks. Oh, yeah, sure, we sure. Don't, um, we, don't I, do, we don't make um, a barry neck or soprano neck. Soprano necks we don't make. Because there's too much variation. The horns are too different from one brand to another. Oh, got it. Okay. You, you know, the thing is, you need to understand. Say, well, I want a saxophone main neck for my younger sound world soprano. Well, when I have them made, how many have I got to get? Well, I, you know, maybe I've got to buy 50. And if I have to buy 50, and they sell slowly compared to altos and tenors. I mean, that's a ton of my money. So we don't offer that. What about, and, um, you said barry necks also, same well, thing? Barry, same see, see you, you got the neck, a little bit of short thing, and then you got the pigtail. Well, yeah. now that's not to say that I haven't been known all for a pigtail or two, but the, the fact of the matter is on my Barry back here, which happens to be the prototype of the Saxon May Super 400 Barry and Silent Copper, the, the pigtail diameter tapers are very different from what's on a Selmer Barry or a Yamaha or what, what have you, because we understand this stuff. Okay. Got now, let, let me show you another magic trick that, that you need to know, and, and these people don't know. Now, this, this neck I have here in, in my hot little hands is brass, okay? It, it, it's made of the same brass alloy that's usually used for saxophone bodies and all that, which is what's known in the trade as 70-30, 70% 70 copper, 30% zinc. Um, realistically, it's probably... 70, maybe 25, and 5% 5 11 herbs and spices. Uh, but, but, yeah, you know, but anyway, basically 73. So I'm taking my finger and thump it. You know, I'm deadening it. There we go. Hear that? Yes. All right. Now, trust me when I tell you. This is a different net, of course. Uh, this has got, you hear it, how it sounds different? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. And there ain't nothing different but the alloy? And you're telling me that the material doesn't make any difference? Ooh. 
So let me let me let's expand on this for a second. So and that was one of the questions that, you know, um, I had for you, you know, what difference does the material make? You did that thumb test, right? You did the the, the brass alloy versus well, the yeah, copper. Yeah, what, this lower. Here, this is an original net of my personal King Super 20 Silver Sonic. Okay. Ooh, there's an exotic horn. Oh, wow, yeah. Significantly different. Um, and someone may ask, so what? Like someone may say right now. That's an original Mark VI net. Okay. Someone listening may, right now may, may say, so what? So what's the big deal? Like, you know, so how does the material, you know, what does it do to the sound? That's right. I'm going to tell you, you get ahead of the lesson. Now you just back off a minute, girl. <laughs> awesome. We need to flick every one. Yeah, no, no I, I want you to see that these are all different. <clears throat> Uh, significantly different, and this is sterling silver. And uh, I know what the recipe is. It's ninety-five percent silver, and I'm not going to tell you what the eleven herbs and spices are, because that's proprietary alloy that we use here on that product. And we've we've made a bunch of necks out of that. We know what it sounds like now. To answer your questions, the vast majority of saxophones and saxophonettes are made of brass, 70 30 brass, vast majority. And then it started to be a long time ago that people started using solid silver. Now, I'll spare you the three-hour lesson in physics, but I'll, but I'll tell you that silver resonates. In other words, it begins to vibrate and respond quicker than brass. So if you've got a solid silver neck, that neck will respond quicker. There won't be any delay. And also, it'll facilitate a larger dynamic range. And then, if you go back to those saxophone um, experts on sax on the web, they're going to tell you that, well, silver makes it too bright. You sure about that? You've, you've tested it. Oh, you haven't. How many, how many times did you take the exact same net and make it in different materials? And say, oh, you didn't. Then you don't know, do you? Hi. All right, a lot of that going on. Now, here's a, another thing. So silver is quicker and um, has a big dynamic resonance. Doesn't really affect the tone. It might be one or two percent brighter, but it's it's next to nothing. Got it. Okay. All right. Now, if you get a copper neck solid copper, then that neck is going to be darker in sound. Copper um, is a, a little softer metal and uh, it, it just doesn't um, have the brightness. And if you've got a horn that is too bright, like a Yamaha, and I love Yamaha saxophones. I love Jake plays Yamaha saxophone. But when Jake became my student, what did we do? We got him a solid copper neck for a Yamaha. What is it, custom? What you got? Yeah, it's a custom. He got a top of the line Yamaha. Yeah. That he had before he met me. It's a change. It changed everything. I mean, what happened was it got a little dent in it. And like you were saying about Delmer, it was a bit, you know, muffled. It wasn't getting the sound through as much, you know old one out neck. So I came to Steve and he, it, it was one of those, it was a solid copper neck with some of those nodes, some of the weights on the pressure nodes at the end that he was just showing you. Um, and essentially what it did to my horn was it made the sound a little bit darker. It's still bright because it's Yamaha, the whole body, but it, um, I get, it's a more dynamic sound range. I can get more tones out of it. Um, just a lot more possibilities in terms of sort of, the, the qualities of the sound all around. Here, here's an analogy I use 
when you were in the first grade, Donna, the teacher gave you, you went to school and the teacher gave you a box of crayons and there were six big crayons in there. And then when you were in the third grade, teacher gave you a box that had 20 crayons in it. Now you could still draw the same pictures, but the 20 crayon box gave you a lot more nuance and so yeah. it's the same thing. And I love Steve, but I wouldn't be playing it if I didn't think it, it really made a difference. And it, it completely made the difference. Um, the copper really allows for a greater sound range. All right, now, now, Jake said something else is worth expanding on. He said that his original Yamaha neck had a, a dent in it. Yep. And once they're damaged, they don't ever pay the same. They never play the same. Never. Not ever. Why? Because typically the the metal is stretched a little bit when it forms. Now. So you got a little more length than you had initially. And in the neck, a little bit of difference makes a huge amount of, of change. And even worse. Think about if you had a piece of uh, brass wire in your hand and you're doing this, what happens is the, the apex of that gets hot temperature-wise, and then it breaks. And why does it break? It breaks because it gets brittle. And that's, if you go talk to a metallurgist or an engineer, and they'll tell you that that's called work hardening because the lattice of molecules within that brass or silver or whatever, uh, brass is worse than anything else, uh, gets disrupted. And so it doesn't resonate the same way. It's just basic science. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's why old horn necks don't work as well. Um, they used to be used to because they've been you know, work hardened by, you know, people shoving the necks on, people dropping them, right? Right. Or some knucklehead says, oh, I can fix that bent neck. It's got to pull down. I'm just going to pull it up. I'm going to grab it by the cord and just pull it up. Are you kidding? If your repairman wants to do that, then you need to close your case, lock it, and run for the door. Because that, that's somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Okay, that's an important point, actually. Can so so a lot of times people will say, you know, like you have to be very careful putting the neck on your horn, and uh -huh. a lot of times people will get the what's called a pull down. Can you talk about what you mean by pull down for people that are yeah. not aware of that, and then what they should do? All right, look, here's a couple things you need to know about that. Here's the receiver of the horn. Here comes the neck tenon, which is straight, and it go when I insert the neck in the horn, I want to go straight like that. I don't want to do that. Put it in an angle, yeah. I want it to be straight. Then I don't want to put pressure on it here and bend it down like that because that will put a crease. This neck should be perfectly round. And this neck will then have a crease. And people now it doesn't have much of a crease. Yeah, I use a jeweler's loop. And we'll examine it. You can always see that crease. Don't let them tell you you can't see it because you can. And if, if it, your neck isn't round, it's not going to play the same. Don't try to convince me it will because it won't. So pulling, so pulling down where the, let's say where the cork is, it can make it, make it like oval, <laughs> almost oval on yep. the inside if you That's keep doing right. it that way. So then where do you suggest when people put the neck on the horn, right? They put it straight in. Where should they hold the, where should they hold the neck so you don't have to worry about that happening? And what Steve's doing is he's putting his hand close to, um, and every, every, every hand, uh, neck's going to be different, but close to where the octave, uh, pip is. Yeah. Yeah, Steve has told, taught me to always, you know, when you're when you're putting the horn together, the first thing you do is you you want to hold it here, you know, as close to the top going down where it, you know, you're putting it into the body. Um, but also you want to put the, the the mouthpiece on first. 
because that also can create some pull down because if you're if you're trying to jam the mouthpiece on while it's already in the body you might be pulling that down too so you want to put the mouthpiece on first and then grab it from the back and push it down let's track right now while we're on this general area i want to say something about cases and how cases damage necks now jake uses on his alto He's got an RS Berkeley case, and it's got a little um, pocket for the neck where you put the neck in there and it doesn't move. Does not move at all. Holds it snugly. Very good. Now, what about all these folks we know that have um, saxophone, what I'm going to call box type cases that just have a little box and your neck and your mouthpiece? and court grease and, you know, all that going there. Do you think that neck moves around like this and gets a little dense? Do you think you're stupid if you put it in there? Yep. What about putting it in the bell of the horn in a, a, a bag? A pouch, yeah. But don't put it in a Crown Royal bag. That's not thick enough. Right, 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 okay. right. You, you got to get a, a, a very padded pouch uh, where it doesn't get damaged. Or, the way I do it, you would love this. You got to get a separate case. Oh, interesting. You. And we make several of these, all of which have the famous, world famous Sax Gourmet logo on. But my neck is not going to get damaged. And her neck is very prone to being damaged. So don't let it happen to you. You know, it's what's interesting, and I'm thinking before, but what you talked about, like just dings on the neck. I mean, you know, when there's dents, then then that's a that's a huge problem. What about like little you know, dings and stuff like that. Even every little ding what is going to cause a problem. Thing, you, little, I'm talking about very tiny. You probably can't hear the difference. Okay, okay. But but if it's got any kind of crease in it, no matter how small, get another neck. Get another neck. Okay, that, that's important, I think, for people to know, um, you know, for sure. Um in terms of, you know, we talked about like, uh, you know, the, the materials that are next are made well, of. Before you shift gears, and I hate to, Okay. There, there's something else. Now, Donna. Oops. Yeah. How could you pull that down? Yeah, can you talk about that? So you've got your sax gourmet neck there, and what is that piece that you just you just um, uh, you know showed us for those people that are listening? I, I tell you what it is. Now this is our top of the line sax gourmet sterling silver neck. Uh, this is right here on it, sax gourmet designed by Steve Goodson. That would be me, and <laughs> on the other side. It says Sax Gourmet, and it has a serial number. So I know if this neck fits a Yamaha, or this neck is designed for Selmer, etc. We make these for most popular saxophones. Okay. We don't make them for everything, but anything reasonable you can come up with, we probably got this for. Now, this is our most expensive neck. And... If you compare the price of a uh, Yamaha solid silver neck, Selma solid silver neck, uh, Yamaha Sal solid silver neck, uh, they're all in the same range. Uh, mine is, I, I think, a little more expensive. It's fourteen hundred dollars. And you say, "Well, wait a minute, Steve, that's a lot of money." No kid, how much did you pay for that mouthpiece you got on there? How much did you pay? And this is a lot more complicated. 
to manufacture, and it'll make a lot bigger difference. That was now, the question I was going to ask you too. And when you're done with this, if you can get into how you know really truly important the neck is in terms of like intonation and and sound. But yeah, continue on. Yeah. Now, your question was, how do we know where to put this and all that? Well, we, we go back to this, and I look for the nodal points of the note G right on top of the staff and B, because they're the, they're the most unstable notes on the horn. The G and the D or the G and the B, you said? If it was G the G and, and the D. The D, yes. The D, see, the first octave of the saxophone, the lower notes, are all fundamentals. Yes. And then everything D and above is an overtone. Everything. D. Overtone. First overtone needs a little help. G. Now, I'm going to spare you a three-hour lesson in acoustics about why G is unstable, but there is a reason. Uh, but at any rate, you know, we didn't just stick this on here. We made all this to fit because we pay attention to that sort of thing around here. Um, now, another thing about this net is we also have our weights. That's what I was going to ask you. Okay, okay. We described these earlier. And another thing, you can't see this very well. The, the pit right here, the pit is not a straight tube. Only an idiot would put a straight tube in the a, 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 a 40, a, a hourglass shaped tube and it's uh, threaded. So you don't get that little whisper that goes on, you know, cuts it, the threading cuts that out. Interesting. Interesting. Well, why, why isn't everybody else doing that? Yeah. Well, it, yes. They ain't thinking about it. That's why. Yeah. Or, or it's a money, it's a, you know, it's a financial <laughs> issue. That's, uh, that's a whole other what? can of worms. No, it, it, really. I know what each component costs. It doesn't cost that much. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. It took the breath, that pep and all that. It, it's, it costs not nothing, but it, it's, you know, because it's, it's a complex thing because it's hourglass shaped. But, uh, interesting. Yeah. You got to know. Now, I think it's also important at this point to recognize how nets are manufactured. Yeah. Uh, as I was prepping for this session with you, Donna. I uh, I watched some other net uh, videos on YouTube. Some of those people should be very ashamed uh, of trying to convince you that what they're saying is true, because if you're of normal intelligence, you'd say, how could that be? All right, think about this. The way these necks start, or all these necks start, we cut essentially a, a cone of metal, then through a, a process, it's not worth describing, just we know how to lap it around. And then we, um, well, there's several different ways you can join the, you know, that seam. Because we want to have a minimum, if possible, uh, uh, lack of continuity there where that seam is. That's why only an idiot would make a neck that had two seams when you could do it just as easily with one. Mm. Correct? Of course. <laughs> mm. I watched a guy with two. Uh, he, he did a bunch of other crazy stuff too. Um, it makes a difference. If you don't believe me, try it yourself. Uh, then that seam is either braised, silver solder, which is like what a jeweler does, or in the case of us, plasma welded. Ooh, plasma welding 
makes a perfect seam where the metals join and it's almost like the whole thing was made out of one piece of metal. Wow. Plasma welding is expensive. A plasma welding machine just to make the seam cost over a million bucks. Oh, um, well, I mean, we're making, we're heating the same way the sun works. It's plasma. And, and I don't see these other people doing it. Oh, if they were, they'd be using that in their advertising. All right, so now I've got a cone. Now, I, I, I form the cone over a, a, a round piece of metal called a mandrel, which we've had precision machine to where that mandrel has exactly the taper I want of my neck because that neck and all these other necks are not an even taper. Uh, most of them are parabolic to a different degrees. You want a different parabola for a con than you do for a silver, for example. Hmm. But uh, then we form it around that. And then, you'll love this, we fill it with liquid lead. Let the lead cool. And then we put it on a jig like this. And we pull the handle down and it bends it to the shape I want. But then, if you try to do something like that yourself, or you've ever tried to just bend a piece of copper pipe or something, you'll say, well, wait a minute, at the interior apex, it's got little wrinkles. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you avoid that? Now, the, the lead only serves to keep it from collapsing on itself. Okay? But those little wrinkles are still there. Mm -hmm. Try it. Now, what in the world are we going to do about that? We have a tool made or a jig that is the exact shape of the neck I want. Exact down to a thousandth of an inch. Exact. Then we plug one end completely. We, we weld something over the end. And then through the other end, we inject uh, we, we've tried different things I'm not going to tell you what it is we use but I'll tell you a couple of choices you got you can inject uh, ice water because it's hydraulic and it expands that neck it's at about 800 pounds a square inch and it expands that neck to where it fits that die perfectly and um, two, you get it to exactly the dimensions you want. Process is called hydroform. Hydro water. Yeah. Also, uh, sometimes other manufacturers, I know they do this, and not many of them do, but they use um, hydraulic fluid, like, you know, it's in power steering on your car. Because that, that's designed for that sort of thing. But the trick is, Donna, you've got to have exactly the right dimensions. And being a little bit off is not acceptable. And, um, you know, I, I hear these uh, experts um, talk about, well, you know, my neck plays a lot better on your horn. Well, maybe it does, but mine plays even better than that because mine is more accurate. Because we know here how to do the math to calculate the perfect taper. And we have, um, we, we've written all that down and we understand science. We also understand the length that it should be. And if you put a king neck and a Mark VI neck side by side, they're not the same. Let me ask you something in terms of, um, because there's, you know, every day practically you hear of, you know, 
new uh, new instruments coming out in in Asia for right. the most part. New right. mouthpieces coming out. How do you how do you account for that? Because there's so many there's so many different mouthpieces oh, out there, there now. And yeah, how it works. And that's if you knew how it works over there, um, then you'd say, "Oh, got it." Okay. Um, well, Don, let's say you wanted to have some Don Schwartz saxophones made. Okay, that's going to be your brand. And you call me because I'm your buddy. And you say, Steve, can you tell me some people that make saxophones over there that I can trust with my money and all that? Sure. Call this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. I'll make some more. And so you call the factory over there and you talk to the president of the company and say, this is what I want to do. If there's anything specific you want done, um, they, they can make anything you want. But if there's something that ought to be there that's not, just because you didn't want it. Example, on our horns, our saxophones have keyword to high G because G is the bastard altissimo notes, right? <laughs> Yeah. The other one's a lot easier than G. You know that. I have a video on that. Yeah, I had to play it. Yeah. <laughs> of course. No, no, I've seen it. I've seen it. But, but think about this. Why couldn't the people that made your horns, and you've got several, good saxophones, why couldn't they put a high G key on there? It's not rocket science. Oh, they could have. Or... On all your horns, I want you to try this. You can finger C in the upper octave with the middle finger of the left hand. Or you can finger it with the index finger and the middle side key. Now, Donna, I want you to do that on your horn and tell me, is the pitch exactly the same? No, of course not. <laughs> what do you mean, of course not? Come down here to New Orleans. We'll show you a horn that plays... Exactly the same. Timbre, pitch, all mm -hmm. that on both of them. Because we put a speaker key on the upper stack because all saxophones have that problem. So, but why didn't your horn have that? You got nice instruments. They knew about it. If they'd been watching me, and I know they all do, for the last 25 years. Or when I used to go to the NAM show, the, the head of all these different factories would come around and carefully look at my horns to see what I had done. And um, sometimes they'd try to buy one to take back. So they copy it. I wouldn't sell them to them. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a huge difference in saxophones, one brand to another. Consequently, Donna, there has to be a huge difference in next. And don't let anybody tell you it's not that way. Now, this uh, particular expert I keep referring to, I will not call his name, but this expert has run an ad recently from some guy, I don't know who he is, okay? He's not a famous player, okay? He's he not. He's not anybody you've heard of or anybody else. And the guy talking about, oh, yeah. He was blank, insert name here. Uh, he's been working on these necks for months. No, he hadn't. No, he hadn't. He worked on calling over there and sending them the money, and they sent him a bunch of their off-the-shelf necks with his logo on them. That's exactly what went down. And, uh, you know, you look, how long has that guy been in business? Well, I've been in the, making necks. Since the 90s. Yeah. And he popped up out of nowhere uh, about three years ago, at most. There's something wrong with that picture. Now, let me tell you about a couple other things that you need to watch. If you're buying that room, I said, don't buy one that's made out of two ads. Okay. And I talked about how we bent the neck and then how we got the wrinkles out. And we've got a perfectly round tube. Okay. Now, 
how about this? I saw, and really, I busted out laughing when I saw this, a guy talking about, you ought to take a death hammer and put a bunch of little dimples all up and down the neck. Wow, based on what you said before, no. Well, no, man, man, if you're doing this with a little death hammer, and I'm, re I'm real good with a death hammer, but I'm not good enough where I can make those dimples exactly the same. Am I? And I'm good. I am. Are you coming off your hand hammer next? <laughs> yeah, this guy, this yo yo, you know, are you kidding? I'm just saying what it is, man. It's, yeah. yeah. It how didn't long, make sense to me when I first saw it. Yeah. So. And how, how long have you been doing this, Steve? I don't know, since the 90s. How long has he been doing it? I think that this particular guy has been doing this maybe two years. Well, good for him, but really, and I'm real good with a dent hammer, but how could I make those dents, little dents, exactly the same? How could it? I can't do it. And I'm as good as anybody you're going to meet. And on top of that, you can't do it. Yeah. And yeah. that son of a bitch can't do it either. <laughs> now, let me show you something else so you know what's going on. Give me that. This one? Yeah. There we go. Oh no, let's get one more. Yeah, here we go. Can you see what's inside there? Uh, no, not really. Oh, yes, I can. It's threaded. It's threaded on the inside. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Yes. Now, Donna. You ever play golf? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't play golf. I'm more into those like soccer types of things. I like soccer. Oh, no, okay. Okay. no, I know you're a big soccer fan, but, but Donna. You know what a golf ball looks like? Oh, sure, yeah. A golf ball's got little dimples in it. Yes. All right. Now, think, if you will, of that energy wave going through the neck tube, but there are places where it gets disrupted um, because of some mystical physics. Uh, but you know yourself from playing saxophones, that the low C, C sharp, B, and D tend to be unstable. The low, very lowest ones and go blah, 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 blah. right? That's even the best cuts. Well, Donna, if I could fix that energy wave so it goes through there smoother, that wouldn't happen. Now, how'd that work? The reason the golf ball's got dimples is it flies through the air, and those dimples cause a brief little uh, thin layer of turbulence to come up around the ball and makes it fly further and straighter. Ooh, if I knew where the, the nodal point of D, and I could put some threads in there, that will make a little bit of turbulence, just a little bit, but am I get enough to get rid of that? Okay. And, and why is that rocket science? I've been threading nets for years, even before we were manufacturing. And the threading, the, so that is on the uh, on the receiver part only. Like, is it all throughout? On the yes, on, on the tenon. Yes, on the tenon. Okay, it's no, only no, on no. the tenon. That being said, we have manufactured some that it went all the way through. We've manufactured some where it's only on the mouthpiece end, but we find this gives the best results. Interesting. Okay. But um, we try these things. You see that? That's another thing. Yeah. I, you know, I can show you a box full of necks that are, you know, that were our experiments. No, absolutely. I totally agree. I totally understand that. You know, you test everything out. You know, you, you don't put it on market until you've tested it out, you know, um, uh, numerous times and stuff like that. Well, um, and Jake tested it out because he's, he's a better player than I am. And when, and let me tell you something else, when Mike Brecker was alive, Mike Brecker used to test it out. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I've learned here is a lot of it is trial and errors throwing yeah. shit against the wall because really you can't really know how it's going to work until you try it. You know, you can do all the calculating you want. It's, it's the same thing with the repair. You're going through the whole horn 
saxophone's very much like that. You're just, you know, shooting darts in the dark sometimes. And, and also because there, like I mentioned before, there's so many, there's so many nowadays, I mean, compared to the year 2000, right? But before all the Asian horns hit the market so much. Oh, I never finished, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. Why, why are there so many? All right, most, if not all of the factories are assemblers, not manufacturers. In other words, they don't make the body tube, the neck, or the bell, or the bow, and certainly not the keyword. There's three factories in China that make virtually all the keyword for everybody. And I know one of the owners real well, and he told me that he inventories 5,000 different woodwind keys. He makes clarinet keys, noble keys, and flute, and, you know, all that. But if you've got a factory you want to establish, you can get any kind of saxophone key you want. He probably has it in stock. And so the, all these little factories are just, you, you look for it. And here's something I tell Jake all the time, everybody else all the time. You look at it, that horn you're thinking about buying, you want to know how it's different? If you can't hold it in your hand and see the difference, the difference isn't there. If you can't see the difference, the difference is not there. And don't let some snake oil guy, selling guy, tell you it's there. Because on these, if you examine them closely, the different lengths, the different tapers, you know, why wouldn't they be? Because Ford parts don't work on a Chevrolet. But right. Some of these experts, one in particular, who I find very offensive because he's such a liar and I'm not going to call his name, but, you know, he's one size fits all. That for your Con 10M, uh, fits your Selma Mark 6. And just for example, boys and girls, the tenon diameter on 10N is 28.4 millimeters. And on Mark 6, it's 27.5. That's mm, a big difference. Yeah, that's a big yeah. difference. And, and it's not that you can just swap out the tenons, because what about that tube leading up to the tenon? How to get, don't tell me they're all the same, because they're not, I know better. So, and so, okay, so what's really interesting here, though, is also that, you know, with the factories in China, they're basically assemblers, but it's really, right. when you think about it, they're all essentially, maybe I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, they're all really the same instruments for the most no. part. No. They're not. Okay, so I, I am wrong. No. Okay. Because, um, you know, you can go to a, a good Chinese restaurant, a lot like Sharon and I love to go to a restaurant here in New Orleans, of the five happiness. Food's great. We know, we know the poop people and all that, but you choose your entree from column one and then a couple of sides from column two and three, right? So if you're building saxophones, take a body tube from column one, uh, a neck from column two, uh, a bell from column three, and then keys from column five. Ooh. Yeah, that's where it works. Okay, and does that answer the question how your, you know, like your necks are, you know, um, specific to the horn, so to speak, specific to the yes. brand? So that's, that's... So you can identify it. Okay, and so, you know, there's so many different brands out now, so that's why... See, you're assuming if you call me up and you say, listen, Steve, I've got a Donald Schwartz saxophone and I want to buy it one of your sterling silver necks for. Well, it only takes a little calling around if I don't already know, which I probably do. Okay. Find out which factory made it. Got it. That's that's the question I was now, asking. Okay. I can do that. You can't do that. Right. I mean, I'm not stopping you, but I'm saying, you don't know who to call. I do. I've been doing business in Asia since before it was cool to do business in Asia. Yeah, no, that's true. Based on what you said, absolutely, for sure. I, I know all those guys. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them are great friends of ours. You know, they, they, they come over here and they sit in my showroom. And, you know, we go out to the finer restaurants in New Orleans. Or, 
you know, they're longtime friends. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I know. And, and if I don't know, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, Donna, I don't know what neck to send you. You're going to say, well, could I send you the original neck? No, because you wouldn't want to be buying a new neck if your original one was perfect. Now, would you? If you think there's something wrong, you're going to talk to me about replacing that net. And, you know, come on. You know, we, we've been doing this and dealing with players for years. You know, I know what's going to come up. And it, it, it burns me up to see all these people getting taken advantage of. It's their own ignorance, which I don't fault them for. They don't know anything about next day you know, fall into the greedy hands of somebody. Yeah, there's what I've learned about learning this stuff from Steve. There's a heavy lack of critical thinking when it comes to picking the customization of your horn. You know, a lot of people yeah. just, they just go with what the tribe goes with. Oh, my teacher, Mark Six, I'm going to buy a Mark Six. Oh, this person plays Jody Jazz, I'm going to buy Jody Jazz. Oh, this, you know, and not to say that any of those are wrong, but you know, it's, it's not, you know, one size fits all. And so you can go like, Oh, wow. You know, I actually prefer this Yamaha for me. It's I prefer this Yamaha and I prefer it with the sax gourmet neck and I use a Conley mouthpiece and I'm using the Harry Hartman, you know, hemp reed and that's my setup, but I had to try a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Everybody's different. They have to try what works for them. Aren't you suspicious? Somebody who uses a hemp breed. What kind of professional musician? <laughs> Wait a minute. I like those hemp breeds. I was using them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the best breed I've ever played. I'm, and, and that's just me being critical. You know, Steve's giving me a few other reads where I'm like, nah, this ain't it, you know. Yeah, it's got to go by what feels right and what's, you know, like I use the yeah. Legeres, you know, I like the Legeres. They, they work for me, you know, um, sure. everybody's, everybody's setup is, is different for sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious, though, um, also, you know, like with your neck uh, and neck enhancer, um, there's so many. Also, there's there's a lot of different mouthpieces out now today, too. Oh, oh, I yeah. love you. You, you. you You think about this. Stuff and think about. Oh, now think about this. Here's the neck, end of the neck. Here's the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece goes over the neck like that. So this much of the neck goes inside the mouthpiece in the chamber. The the thing is, is by altering where the mouthpiece fits on the neck, what you're altering is actually the volume of the chamber, the cubic capacity of that, not the length. Let's not be stupid here. Okay? Okay. Uh, because I can, I mean, we got a ton of mouthpieces here that we manufactured. And I learned the mouthpiece business from Sandy Runyon. Uh, and Mr. Runyon uh, forgot more than anybody else has ever known about my thesis. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that you need to carefully consider the science. And I have guys that come in here at night and says, well, my horn plays flat, so I'm going to ask you to please shorten the neck. Are you kidding? You know, that's like saying, Steve, I'm going to run a, a, a marathon. Would you cut off my right leg at, at the ankle? So so the stroke in this, no, really, it's the same thing. Or, Steve, my horn is, is always sharp. I need to make it longer. Would you put an extension on there? I'll give you a conditional yes on that sometimes. But, but because... If I put an extension on there that is not tapered, just under the, the place where the cork is, see, that's not tapered right there. Does it make any difference? Nah. But you start fooling with the taper because the, the larger in diameter that the tube is, you know, it, it, it gets bigger as the taper increases, 
then the flatter it plays at that given node. Ooh. Oh. Oh. I just want to point out something that I was confused at initially when I learned about this, but the neck enhancer that we were talking about, it's not an extender. It doesn't make the neck longer in terms of where you put the mouthpiece. You know, I'm going to put the mouthpiece in the same place that I would without it, but it goes farther into the mouthpiece when you put this on. You know? The cubic capacity of the tone chamber and the mouthpiece is all, in that regard is the only thing that matters. Yeah. So, so, so don't, just don't listen it's to these just, experts. It's enhancing sort of where the where it meets the chamber in the mouthpiece, um, which is what I had to learn. Yeah, but it's true. And if, like I said, come down here, sit around with me, and, and we can show you exactly how all that all that works. You know, your horn, your mouthpiece, your your reed, and we can try all that. And you say, oh, you're right about that. Well, why the hell isn't everybody else doing this? I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Now, granted, I've been doing this for a real long time. I'll be 72 years old in a couple of months, and I've been doing repair on saxophones since I was 14. You know, so I've got a good bit of experience. I started building my own horns, uh, you know, completely to our original design uh, in the early 90s. And there are thousands of horns all over the world that say designed by Steve Goodson on them. Can any of these other some bitches say that? Nope. Let me let me ask you another question here um, that we didn't get to with the neck. The underslung, you know, what's the difference between, you know, just a regular neck, okay. you know? I'm going to raise my right hand and say, Donna, because you're my good friend, I promise to tell you the truth. Okay. <laughs> and, and I will retract any other comments I might have might have made uh, in the past about this. Okay? okay. Donna, if a neck has an underslung octave key, as a number of mine do, compared to a conventional octave key on the top, top, bottom, the ones on the bottom are more exotic looking and sell better. Oh, wow. So there's no difference. Not in, so in my opinion, we were talking about pushing, you know, not, um, pulling down on the neck, it's easier to push down on the neck and not ruin that mechanism. Okay. Is it also easier? You know how young kids, um, uh, well, it's not just young kids, but a lot of times, you know, um, uh, that easy fix that you can do if the, 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 the neck is up just by a little bit. Um, is there less of that happening when the neck is under? So what's that easy fix? I'd like oh. to buy it. The bending. Yeah. The, so, so yeah. So if the, if sometimes if the, um, um, gosh, I can't, I can't describe this, uh, well enough right now. And this happens all the time. With you know, You're talking about like, if it, if it bends out of place on the top. Uh, no. So if the, it's not even actually time that's the octave key actually on the instrument where oh, oh. it keeps the, it keeps the octave, it keeps the octave key open. That's what I'm I trying to say. That's no brain. Right. That is an easy fix. As long as the neck mechanism works accurately and there's no excess play in it, which is easy. You, you can fix that with your thumbs. But is there a difference between the underslung and the, the regular conventional way that those keys, will that happen? Could that happen on an underslung key as well? Yeah. I guess it could. Okay. Happens every day. Okay. Okay. And the but same fix. Really? The underslung necks were when I was first getting started in the uh, neck business, and you can go back and look at the history of us. Uh, look back in the 90s, and you'll see we were manufacturing a product called the Masterpiece Necks. It had an unslung octave mechanism. Why? Because I also had this neck, which is off my Super 20. <laughs> and everybody thought, oh, yeah, it's got a Super 20 uh you know, that's what Cannonball used. And, uh, you know, really? <laughs> you want to buy one? <laughs> oh, but, you know, on, on our most recent design here, 
we're using a conventional thing. And the reason we are is that, frankly, it's easier for you as a player to adjust with your thumbs. Okay. It, 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 there's not a, a huge amount of difference, but it's enough where I'm saying it ought to be like this. Got it. It doesn't really matter. Now, understand this. Your neck, in theory, it, that tube is perfectly round. Now, it increases in diameter, you know, because it's tapered, but it's perfectly round. And so I could put the octave key, the vent on the side, on the top, on the bottom, doesn't matter. If it's perfectly round, uh, doesn't matter. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, give me give me the neck off of category five. I'm gonna show you something else. Okay. You're gonna love this. <laughs> I think so. I, I can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a hurricane. Right yeah, that's one we want. You're going to love this. And you're going to say, Steve, it's a madman. Oh, but this works great. You can ask anybody who owns one. Okay. Now, look here. This is neck off our top of the line, category five. Okay. Now, okay. we make the tenon out of uh, 70, 30 brass, because I want it to be soft so I can adjust it easily. We're okay. gonna talk about adjusting in a minute. The octave key here is uh, in a conventional configuration. Nothing you hadn't seen before. But wait a minute. What about that octave key right there? What? There's an octave key right there? Wow. Okay. Can you hold that closer? That's, oh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, this, this horn's also got two more on the body. Horn's got a total of four octave vents and all of your horns have two. Yeah, that's right. And why would that be? Because uh, there are 12 semitones in a chromatic scale. The way we play music in the Western Hemisphere. The two octave vents that are on your horns are a compromised position. One works on the notes between D on the fourth line and A above the staff, right? And everything else is controlled by another. You with me so far? Yeah. All right. So as we get up toward that A, that vent is a long way from where on the body the first open tone hole is. It gets further and further away. Okay, you with me on how that works? Yeah, yeah, okay. Now, Miss Donna, how about if instead of having just two, I had four, so I reduce the number of compromise, or the amount of compromise, so it plays better. It's more responsive, and it's much more in tune. Interesting. But, You've got to have a more elaborate mechanism. Now, I once built a horn that had six octave keys on it. And boy, it played great. And it would stay in adjustment for as much as five minutes at a time. Then you'd have to work on it because the mechanism was too damn complicated. But okay. this, this system here, we manufacture these half for years. And it works great. And wait a minute, who else is doing that? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. That's because they don't know how. I do. And you find that a lot of people, a lot of buyers get sort of scared of these added mechanisms sometimes because nobody's making them. They think there's sort of like a catch to it or there's, you know. And it really isn't. It's just that the saxophone design business is such a conservative um, market because everybody wants to play something that resembles like you know, what their teachers play, what their teachers play. And that's kind of how it is in most, you know, especially in classical instruments, you know, everything is about and how it was made. But oh, yeah, 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 that's true. But my market is not there. Now, my company is tiny 
manufactured company. We're tiny. Um, I'm not going to tell you how many horns we sell a year or how many necks and how many mouthpieces and all that. But, you know, I don't sell as many as Selmer does or certainly not as many as Yamaha does. But the people who buy a Saks May product are looking for something different, you know, because I, I, our products have features you can't get anywhere else. You just can't get it. You, you, you call Jerome Selmer and I say, hey, Jerome, I want to get one of those uh, new, uh, what do they call that new model they got? Not oh, Selmer. Um, uh, yeah, That's I know what you're yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I don't remember the name either, but yeah. But I want, I want an upper, I want a speaker stack on, on the upper stack, speaker key. Can you do that, Jerome? Well, he could, but he won't. Okay. Because it would be different from everything else. But in my case, I want to be different because we do all the research here. Do you ever foresee... <laughs> you know, in the future, um, saxophones moving towards having more octave vents, more people listening to what you're, you're, you're doing and trying, trying to do that. Do you foresee that or no? Yeah, I foresee it, but they, they damn sure better know how to do the math. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Have, it have to come with sort of like a cultural change and sort of how people are using saxophones, you know? Yeah. But, but I'm not going to tell them how to do the math. There are a lot of things I know that are proprietary to our company. And, uh, you know, we're, I don't need to do uh, Jerome Selmer's homework for it. I mean, he's my friend, don't get me wrong. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but you understand, business is business. No, for sure. And actually, speaking of business, too, I'm um, curious. Do you, um, are there any... Do you, uh, are there any like new products on the horizon for you in the next year or so? Yep. Um, we have a rock and roll specific alto and tenor handmade of black one. Huh. It just when my health gets better, we're going to build these. Okay. But, the black one. Yeah. The SG one? Yeah. But, but something. You need to understand, Donna, is, is you want, now this is black, because I don't want you to be able to take good pictures of it. Okay. <laughs> so that's, is that, is that the prototype, or is that, that's going to yeah, be, the got it. And and secret smoke. Got it, yeah. So what's going to be the difference, you know, why, uh, how is that going to be different? It's got an altissimo octave key, but only one vent on the body. It doesn't have any mother of pearl key touches. They're all, all metal. Oh, interesting. The, okay. The tone hole taper is different uh, because the body tube is a different taper. Um, we're not going to offer it in black. Like the rest of our horns, it'll be in that new pinning look. Got it. But okay. there's one now, um, and they'll make me buy 50 of those at a time to get the price where, you know, you know, I can do this. Um, and, and that's cash up front, by the way. And that's a big number. Okay. And the other one, we're not going to pick it up because is we have the best battery anybody in the world's ever played. Solid copper. It's got a bunch of acoustic stuff because the Barry has got all of this unique acoustic stuff going on with it. And I consider myself a Barry player by profession. Right. And um, I, I try to take care of a lot of those problems. And we did. So, yeah, that. We got a number of new mouthpiece products. Uh, and... Uh, Oh, I got some other next. Uh, but right now, I think we make, and I think this is the right number, 23 different nets. Another thing we have experimented with, and it worked pretty good, was carbon fiber necks. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a, a colleague in Taiwan who currently manufactures some. And it, it works pretty good. What about the sound? What about it? It, it is, uh, by that I mean, a copper neck sounds a little different than a silver neck, which sounds a little different than a brass neck. So it's a little different. It ain't much different. And then with the carbon fiber necks, would that would that also you know that people do like like we talked before, people ding necks quite frequently, and and would the carbon fiber you know that would be a good reason to get one or? I think so. Carbon fiber is pretty durable stuff. Now, I think about it like um, I, I do a lot of sailing, and there's a difference. People use a, a mast, like a just like a metal mast. You know, but if you're like a real racer, you know, you'll go to carbon fiber mass and it's, it's the same thing. I feel like, um, it's just, you know, it's lighter, but it, um, it might, it might be more like more prone to snap than bend. So, oh. You know, you got to consider that. Yeah. Now, I, I tell you something else. Uh, one of my best friends and, and you know him, you've talked to him, you know, Gary Seagal. Oh, yeah, he's a great guy. Oh, the best. And Stigall is one of the few people in this industry who's been doing it longer than I have. Not much. But like Gary and I talk all the time. And when Gary says something, I take it to heart because he knows what he's talking about. But Gary has been doing a lot of work with 3D printing. Yes. And... um. Gary is extremely knowledgeable about that. And we've discussed maybe making some nets using 3D, 3D printing. That's going to be maybe, interesting. But but Gary, he, he has at his factory, I think Gary told me he had six printers. Well, those printers are expensive. And good for Gary. You know, he, he sent a lot of 3D printed mouthpieces. Yes. And, and they're good, excellent products. He uh, he gifted me one not long ago, and it was amazing. And it was 3D printed. And it was, it was metal and 3D printed. And it was like, you go, Gary. You know, yeah. So maybe we'll go there. Um, I also would like to make a saxophone, since the patents have expired, using the LeBlanc fingering system instead of the conventional fingering system. Okay, talk about that. I'm not. I'm honestly not familiar with the LeBlanc oh, finger system. What What's the benefit of that? All right, all right. All right. Now, Don. So we're playing along, yeah, 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 yeah. and suddenly we got to play some uh, upper stack stuff. This hand, and then we got some C's. But your teacher taught you not to cross finger, right? You teach your students not to cross finger. How about if any time I want to play a C, I, I could play with this finger, with this finger, or that finger. Ooh. Hmm. Go to my saxforme.com site. There's a fingering chart there. Okay. And an article sort of generally explains it all. Also, you and I have agreed throughout this conversation today that the fourth line D is a troublesome note. They got that figured out too. They have a way to add an additional vent on the horn that make just like on your Mark Six, because all Mark Six do this. You play six finger D uh, on, on, for the fourth line, and then if you open the low C sharp key, suddenly that D has a better voice. But on a Mark Six like that. It tends to be a little sharp. But, but, well, we found a partial solution to the problem. And that being said, um, that they have a better solution. Also, well, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, read the article. It's on satscoremate.com. But uh, I own, now, I think I own, they tell me, more of those LeBlanc system horns than anybody in the world. I have six. And um, 
they only made between 1931 and 1980, 1,221 horns, which isn't very many. Yeah, yeah. And um, at the time, I first saw one the first year I made All-County Band. In, in Birmingham, there was a, a kid that had one, that his parents had bought one, and I come to find out they cost twice as much as a Mark VI at the time. Oh. And also, if you own one, it's got adjustments on it. you got to pretty much sleep with a screwdriver in your pocket because oh. it's got everything on it adjustable, but I'm not afraid of it. Um, but I like to build a little block system on But why? Because they, they actually play better. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I made an error in judgment in design is about 15 to 20 years ago, I'd have to look up the manifest. I designed and we built a few horns that were the Marcel, and the Marcel was a classical specific alto. And, you know, if you had the choice, you would probably use a classical alto and then use the jazz alto for your other gigs, but but I can build them differently where that classical alto has got a nice sweet sound and you know all that stuff that you might prefer for your classical work. We couldn't give them away. <laughs> we could, because you go to your saxophone teacher that taught you how to play, they have a Selma. Mm. Yeah. So my, and we're gonna buy what the teacher used. Okay. Yep. And nobody at the time had a Marcel but me. Interesting. Do you know, um, one of my, uh, before we wrap up, um, uh, one of my guests was Paul Cohen, who is an expert. Oh, on... well, yeah. Paul Cohen is a treasure. That guy knows so much, and he's a good guy, too. And, yes. And, you know, I've been blessed to have Dr. Cohen here in my showroom and listen just me and him listen to Dr. Cohen play. And then one time he was making a, a concert appearance in New Orleans and he brought his quartet. They didn't, they forgot to line up a place to rehearse. They rehearsed in my showroom. And so I had the quartet here and I'm just over there going, oh. But I, I talk to Dr. Cohen regularly. Uh, he's knowledgeable, he's a great guy. And I am very envious of his collection of horns. He's got more than I do. And he's got some exotic stuff. So we yeah. all know where I've got to go. No, actually, the reason why I brought him up it, um, is because, yes, he has that exotic collection. You know, we did a two-part series with him. And, um, you know, we were talking about that. And you mentioned, I'm wondering if he's got some LeBlanc horns. I don't think he does. Does he I, know I that don't... you have some? Because that would be a great oh, yeah, conversation. Okay, got it. This And the patents for these are all on my sexualmate.com site in the past. And you look at that and say, what? <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, but if you think about it, it's very cool. You can learn, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff with it. But they were expensive. I mean, real expensive. And then uh, they didn't make many of them, so they were hard to get. Um, the pads that they used on them, were unique to them so you know if you've got one and you need to repad it uh where are you gonna get those pads uh you better hope you know somebody that owns a pad manufacturer company and get them to custom make those sets but you don't know that somebody that you tell them, I'd like, i would like one set of pads for a leblanc system alto uh and they say yeah but how many other sets are you going to buy? Oh, yeah, I need 50 alto sets for saxophone May. I say so. so they'll make one set for me. I see. Okay. Yeah, you can consider new. that, too. And the springs will go play. I could go on and on about how wonderful those horns are. So that, that's, yeah. And Dr. Cohen's got some exotic stuff. And when he buys something exotic, he'll always send me good pictures and, He'll call and we'll talk about it. But he's a wonderful man. 
Yes. The saxophone community is very blessed to have a guy of his knowledge. Uh, plus, he can play. He's a nice guy, too. Absolutely. No, he's he's fantastic. Listen, Steve, so are you. I, I thank you so much for your time. You and Jake, especially. Thanks for, for being here as well. Nice meeting you. And nice meeting. Um, listen, again, you know, this was really so informative and uh, even more so than like, you know, we've talked about saxophone next before, but I learned something new every single time. And I'm, I'm hoping that the listeners learn something new from this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I really, I enjoy doing these. Uh, I do because part of my mission is to spread knowledge to the saxophone community. And I thank you for what you're doing in that regard. I, lo I love all the podcasts. I always watch them. And we try to promote them on our sites, too. All right, Donna, thank you so much. <music>